So tonight we have the uh, distinct pleasure of having our, our very own Courtney Hashimoto as our speaker. Um, Courtney's been a member of Plymouth since 2007. He has been on the Fellowship and Recreation Board, was uh, a, a big part of the Senior Minister Search, Senior Minister Search Committee that called Brigitta. He's planned all sorts of things around here, including the Plymouth Men's Retreat and last year's uh, discernment process, the way that is well for us, and as well as working on planning this Lenten series. He uh, currently is co-leading the Sunday Bible studies, uh, the lay-led Bible study that's at 10 o'clock on Sundays. Courtney and Rosemary were married here in 2007, and Courtney's son Gavin is a junior at Nathan Hale High School and an active member of Youth Forum. So without further ado, I am, well, let's welcome Courtney. So it was um, six years and two days ago that Rosemary and I were standing in this room after being married here. And we were standing in a circle of all those who we loved, were special to us, but we were so new to the church at that point that very few of you were here with us. But six years later, here we are, and you are very much in my thoughts and prayers and my Gratitude goes out to you for walking with us on this wonderful journey that we go on together, this spiritual journey that we as members of Plymouth are on. So will you please join me in a moment of prayer. So Creator God, who has brought us together this evening in service to your word as revealed in the scriptures, Help us discern these words, these ancient words, and how they apply to us, and help us guide ourselves on this Lenten journey towards the cross and towards the resurrection. We thank you for this opportunity to be together. May we be blessed, and may we be a blessing to others. Amen. So, the title for my session is Repent. Who? Me. And the reason for that will become apparent as we get into the context of the Lenten lectionary for tonight. So the focus of tonight will be a word that's very much a part of our Christian tradition, but one which I dare say, probably as a progressive Christian, you haven't thought of that much, at least recently. I certainly know that I haven't. There it is. Repent. Now, I think that all of us probably have feelings, thoughts, images of what this word means. Is Marilee here, by the way? She's still back there. So, um, Mary Lee, could you come up and be our scribe? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you to think of what words, thoughts, or feelings come to mind when you hear and see this word, repent. Any, anything come to mind? If so, just shout it out. Turn around. Turn around. Good. Bad boy. Bad boy? Bad boy, yeah. Be sorry. Be sorry. What else? Start again. Start again. What did I do? <laughs> what did I do? Okay. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Guilty. What? Guilty. Guilty. With an exclamation point, guilty. <laughs> Go back. Go back. Okay. Pretty good list here. Now, what if we added this to it? Repent <laughs> or perish? What about now? How do you feel? Pressure. 
A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. S scary. Scary. Ultimatum. Ultimatum. Really? Really? <laughs> Question mark? Yeah. What? Run. Run? Like R U N? R wrong? Run. 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 Away. Run away. Okay, so <clears throat> repent, repent, or perish. These are loaded words. Here's an image of repent, or perish. And note the, uh, the color of blood, I think. And note the cross, and the cross is really kind of foreboding in the background there. So when we hear repent or perish, it's all of this. It is pressure. It is this feeling of, what's this all about? Here is someone who wants to get across this message. This is repent guy. And he has this message, which he is an urgent message, clearly, and he's wearing it on his chest. Repent or perish. And I think that when the images of what repent means comes up, oftentimes, at least I have this vision of someone with a sandwich board or somebody carrying a sign that says repent. Well, pop quiz. Who first said repent or perish? Was it Jeremiah? Or moving forward in time, was it John the Baptist presaging, presaging Jesus? Or was it in fact Jesus? Or was this all just a figment of someone's imagination until repent guy uh, told us what was at stake here? Or perhaps it was Jesus and repent guy. What do you think? Jeremiah, Jeremiah, yeah, Jeremiah. Anybody else? Repent guy, certainly, yeah, he's saying it. John the Baptist, anybody else? Well, let's take a look. The answer is Jesus and repent guy, because if you look back, look at his sandwich board. It says, repent or perish, Jesus Christ, 33 AD, Luke 13, verse 3. Luke 13, verse 3. Words of Jesus. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Jesus said this. So, with that, the lectionary text for the third Sunday of Lent is Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, which on your handout is on the left-hand side. And I'll read this to you. You can follow along. Thank you. Thank you. Here are the words of the Gospel of Luke. Um, the setting of this, by the way, is that Jesus is speaking to the crowds. The Gospel says crowds of thousands gathered around him. And just prior to this text, some in the crowd were pushing forward to ask him questions. And the question that they ask him is one that Jesus responds to in this passage. So that's the setting. At that very time, there were some present who told him, Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He, Jesus, asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you that unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, 
See here. For three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He, the gardener, replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The words of the gospel, thanks be to God. So, what's happening here? Jesus is speaking to the crowds and he is asked by some in the crowd, what about those that were massacred when they were at worship? And Jesus, in reply, says, basically, were they worse sinners than anybody else? And then he answers himself rhetorically, no, of course they weren't. But unless you repent, you will suffer the same fate. And then to emphasize his point, Jesus doubles down. Without further explanation, he says, or what about those 18 who were killed when a tower fell on them? Were they worse offenders than anybody else living in Jerusalem? And again, it's a rhetorical question because he answers himself again, no, but unless you repent, you too will suffer the same fate. And then Jesus tells this parable about a fig tree which has borne no fruit for three years. So its owner says, cut it down. Why is it wasting the soil? But the gardener intervenes and says, sir, give it one more year and I will feed and nurture it. And if at the end of the time it bears fruit, then well and good. And if not, you can cut it down then. So what is this all about? This is a lectionary for the third Sunday of Lent. Now when our group met and we decided that we would each take a week, the third week was the one that I volunteered for, and then I read this. <laughs> And my first reaction was, uh, can I choose again? Because <laughs> I often find that the words of Jesus are very, very hard. But the interesting thing about it is that my normal impulse when something hard comes up is to turn the page and look for something easy. That was not a possibility here, so I wrestled with it. And the more I wrestled with it, the more I felt that there's something underlying all this which tells me that what Jesus meant is something different than what I think he meant. So to help myself out, I set down some initial questions. Why does Jesus say repent or perish? What's this all about? People were asking him a question about some innocent victims of, uh, of, of tragedy. And Jesus says in response, seemingly a non sequitur. It's not about that. It's about you. Repent or perish. What is Jesus saying this for? And beyond that, why does talk of repentance, whether it's Jesus or anybody else, whether it's maybe repent guy, but it makes me uncomfortable. Why? What is it about repentance that does that? Underlying it all, what does it mean to repent? What is this all about? What does this passage have to do with Lent? Those who organized the lectionary were purposeful in selecting this passage for the third Sunday of Lent in what is called year C. There's a three-year cycle for the lectionary. This is the third year. And this is the assigned passage, and it's been this way since the lectionary was organized in the modern era. And most fundamentally, what does repentance have to do with me? So to help myself start with a baseline, I went to the dictionary, and I just googled repent and looked down and found a sturdy definition, Merriam-Webster's, and I think it's a it's pretty general definition. I think most of us here would probably agree at some level that, yeah, that sounds like repent. Repent, to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. To turn from sin 
and make and dedicate yourself to making yourself better, less sinful. The example used in the dictionary is the preacher told us we would be forgiven for our sins if we repented. And boy, did that hit home. Growing up in Cheyenne, Wyoming, I attended a Baptist church and I heard this message every week mm -hmm. that we were all sinners, that we needed to be forgiven, that we must repent, and if we did, we would be forgiven for our sins. Now the interesting thing about this definition is not that it's anything unusual, it is exactly what I thought it would be. The interesting thing for me, the surprising thing, is to see that the origin is Middle English, derived from Medieval Latin, and the first known use of the word repent is the 14th century, 14th century AD. So about 1,500 years after Christ said these words was the first time that the word repent came into usage. So that is repent. Here's the message of repent, loud and clear. Repent, turn from your sin to Jesus. And that is fundamentally the message of repent that I have carried my life, and it started right there at a very young age. Here's the messenger. Now this is not a photo of my Sunday school teacher. <laughs> However, as a little boy hearing about repentance, I remember being afraid. And I remember feeling that somebody was pointing a finger at me. Somebody was sternly speaking. And I was being called to do things because I was guilty of being bad. I was a sinner. So this is repent and this as the message and repent as the messenger. The question comes up, if repent as a word did not come into usage until long after the gospel was written, what did Jesus really say and what did he mean? Well, the Gospel of Luke in the original Greek used for repent the Greek word metanoia. So when Jesus spoke to the crowds, his words were captured using the word metanoia for repent. The meaning of metanoia is to think differently, to change one's mind accompanied by a change in conduct. So when Jesus says repent, he is saying change the way you think and act. Now very important is that nowhere in the definition of metanoia is there any reference to sin. Metanoia is neutral in terms of whether or not it involves turning away from sin. It just means change your mind accompanied by a change in conduct. In conduct. Normally metanoia is used changing for the better. But the linkage of repentance with sin specifically occurred long after Jesus' time. Well, then the question comes up, why did Jesus say what he said? Jesus, in fact, did, when he spoke to the crowds, refer to sin. Remember, when he was asked about the Galileans who were killed, he said, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans. So is Jesus. Jesus does bring up sin. What was his point in doing that? Well, at the time of Jesus, there was a commonly held belief of divine retribution. So that if something bad happened to you, it was because you had done something to deserve that fate. So when Jesus was asked by the crowd about those who apparently were innocent and were killed, an underlying motive may well have been, tell us why these who were killed fell short in God's favor. B. 
because they obviously suffered a fate that they brought upon themselves. A belief which Jesus categorically rejects because in response to this question, he asks, do you think that they, this happened because they were worse sinners? And he says, no, it didn't. The fact that they sinned or not did not have anything to do with what happened to them. And furthermore, the important point is not what happened to them. It's where you are and what you must do not to suffer a similar fate. And he turns it back on them two times by saying, here's another case where clearly people who were punished did not do anything to deserve that. A tower fell on them. It could happen to anybody. But the message here is don't focus upon the fate of others and try to ask yourselves, why did it happen to them? What is important is to mind your own self and to do what you must do to live rather than die. Jesus is concerned with change, with metanoia, not with sin. So if we have this formula where repent equals change, then what we can do is we can substitute for repent, change the way you think and act. So Jesus' admonition to the crowd then becomes, no, I tell you, but unless you change the way you think and act, you will all perish like they did. Now, does this change the meaning in any way? Especially if we broaden the definition of perish to include not only physical death, but all the other types of death that one may encounter if one does not change the way you think and act spiritual death, death of potential, death of love. Well, if Jesus was saying this to the people who at the time believed in divine retribution, a belief no longer commonly held, the question comes up as to whether or not Jesus' advice is still timely, and, and I think it is. Imagine if Jesus' words were to be applied to gun violence, a very contemporary issue. And some were to ask Jesus, well, what about those who were killed at, you name it? And Jesus' words would be, do you think that those who were shot and killed at Columbine, at Virginia Tech, in Tucson, at Cafe Racer, at Newtown, were they worse sinners than the rest of us? No. I tell you that unless you change the way you think and act, you will all perish as they did. Does that speak to you? If we do not change the way that we think and act about issues of fairness, issues of importance, things that we need to change, do we not die in some way? We may not suffer the same fate physically, but we die nonetheless every time we see a headline of someone else innocent that's gunned down and we have done nothing. Do we suffer that fate? Well, is there still time to change? And Jesus telling the parable of the fig tree tells us unequivocally, yes, there is. By the grace of God, there is still time to change. The gardener intervenes on behalf of the barren fig tree and pleads for one more year, during which time the gardener will tend to the tree, it will nurture it, it will give it fertilizer, it will do whatever it can so that the fig tree realizes its potential to bear good fruit. Just as the fig tree had the gardener, we have a loving God who walks with us, who is there to nurture us, 
and who says there is time. There's time for you to change. There's time for you to realize your potential, whatever that might be. But remember that time is not unlimited. The fig tree was given one more year. None of us here knows how much more time we have. God willing, it may be much more than one year, but it may be tomorrow. In the moment, the only thing that we have, we have the opportunity to change, to go from a path that does not work and to affirm that which gives life. I'd like to end with a personal story of change and redemption. One that started more than two years ago when I had a routine physical, and as part of that physical I had a blood test. And I didn't think anything about it until I received a letter from my doctor a letter that started out saying, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your blood sugar is elevated and you are pre-diabetic. Now, what to do with that? Nothing like this had ever happened to me before. And I didn't know what to do. So, after finding out about what prediabetes meant, one thing came out loud and clear. That prediabetes was progressive, that if untreated, it would lead inevitably to diabetes, and diabetes leads to complications and shortened life. So I was on a slippery slope. But the good news is, that I still had a choice to make. <laughs> I could repent or I could do nothing and perish. Now, along the way, I had angels watching over me. One was named Rosemary. <laughs> One was my doctor. Another was my naturopath. And there were angels who I'll never know, who never know me, but they wrote about this condition and how to treat it, what changes to make, primarily changes in diet, changes in attitude, exercise more, and know that if I made the change that led to life, I could walk away from the alternative, which was to perish. So I chose to repent, I chose to change, and within six months, I had another blood test, and that blood test showed that I was within the normal range. High normal, but nonetheless no longer pre-diabetic. So, I chose to live. But is that the end of the story? No. My story and all our stories don't end with a single glorious sunrise. Every day we face new choices, some of which lead to life and some of them don't. So every day um, I'm reminded that unless I continue to follow the wise course of eating well, of eating the right things, of exercising, avoiding stress, of doing all those things which are life affirming, I may again be at the crossroads of repent or perish. I, I have a choice to make every day. And it's not just about my diet. In so many ways, every day brings up opportunities to either affirm life, affirm values, celebrate what we have, use our creative energies, or to turn away. I can reach out to others. I can be generous. I can be loving or I can shut down. I have that choice. So may I and may we know that every day we confront these doors. One of the doors leads to life and one of them does not. 
we cannot avoid making choices. And that really is a good thing because a choice to me is always an opportunity for change, for repentance, for metanoia. We are not foreordained. We do have the right and the responsibility to choose for ourselves. And we, as we make those choices, may we choose not out of fear, not out of an attitude of repent or perish. May we choose out of faith. May we know that on this path, when the, we make choices as choices we must make, that we will always have a loving God beside us, walking by us, to guide us as we make these choices. May we repent and live. Amen. So I'd like you to move silently into groups of three or four. And the reason for that is that I'd like you to carry into those groups the piece of the worship service, perhaps the reflection on what you've heard right now, and just be with others in this group. And then we'll do some shared prayer together and then after that, the small group questions that you see on the back, uh, you're invited to share them with others. So again, move into groups of three or four. Try to move into groups that you've um, not been with before and do this in silence to the extent that you can.